honored watch is Longines. Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. Maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. Donald I. Rogers, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. George A. Sloan, Chairman of the United States Council of the International Chamber of Commerce. The opinions discussed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Sloan, I'm sure that our audience would like you to tell us first, what is the International Chamber of Commerce, sir? Mr. Huey, the International Chamber of Commerce <coughs> is a group of national committees of businessmen in some 30 nations of the world. In this country, we have about 400 business firms uh, in the United States. Now, it's, it's an organization of world businessmen designed to promote world trade. That's correct, sir. And it's designed primarily to promote United States trade? No, an international group designed to promote international trade, movement of trade, freer movement of trade across the barriers of different nations. Now, are we today, are we Americans selling a great deal of goods abroad? Uh, not today, as much as we normally would in peace times. I see. Are we shipping a great deal abroad under the aid program? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. And what American industries are most concerned uh, with foreign trades? What American products are going overseas now in the largest uh, quantities? Well, in the, in the export field, uh, I would say normally your electrical manufacturers, uh, automobiles, the, the, the rubber industry, and uh, some textiles, is there business machines, and so on. Is there resistance abroad to American products coming into those countries? Not resistance on the part of the consumers. I think there's a great desire for many American products abroad, but there's difficulty in, in, in buying those products. They like dollars. Mm. Exactly. <coughs> well, in order for those countries, uh, European countries, France, England, to buy American goods, they must first get dollars, and in order to get dollars, they must first sell their goods in the United States. Uh, isn't that true? That is true. When they sell their goods in the United States, do we not uh, bring about some uh, harm uh, to local industries, to domestic industries? Generally speaking, no. If our entire economy benefits, why, it's, it's best for America. I but have in mind the wool of Great Britain, or the woolen uh, goods of Great Britain. Uh, they they uh, constituted the largest single export of Britain to the United States last year. Uh, do not our local woolen and worsted industries object to uh, large imports of British woolen and worsteds? Yes, I think they do. I think you have hit upon an exception to the general rule. You might have picked the cheese industry and you would have had the same problem. But I think that our reciprocal trade agreement arrangements out of the State Department uh, offers a means of, of uh, straightening out those problems where they exist. Our, our people, sir, I believe you will agree, uh, <coughs> I think a great deal about world trade, and after the two wars, why, we've had uh, a great deal of experience with it. Now, in your vast experience, sir, uh, is there more enthusiasm in America today for world trade are our people interested in, in trading with the rest of the world more today than they've been at any other time? I should say definitely they are, Mr. Huey. I think if there's any one reason that, it's, that has brought the need of that world trade home to them more than anything else, is the heavy tax bill that's necessary for the sending of billions of dollars in relief and grants and, and uh, economic aid in different kinds. So they're beginning to realize that 
uh, that the only the only thing that can take the place of that relief is is more trade and uh, the selling of more goods to America, and so they'll have more. Will our industries allow that, sir? Will our industries allow that? Yes. Well, where the shoe pinches, as I said before, where it uh, where it's a matter of uh, serious unemployment in an industry. Uh, from that kind of competition, why they have recourse to through the reciprocal trade arrangement and through our uh, tariff commissions and so on. Now you are uh, interested in and in, in engaged in promoting the total volume of world trade, aren't you? I'm interested in promoting two-way trade exactly between the free nations in order as a, as a means of preserving the peace. And the you world. regard trade itself as hopeful as possibly contributing to to world peace. I can't think of anything that, uh, that uh, in a practical way, uh, short of building up armament for military defense, I can't think of anything that's more conducive to world peace. Now, our people, Mr. Sloan, you recall that at the end of the first war, we had something like the smooth hall Tariff Act, and there was terrific resistance in America to world trade. Now, do you think that that resistance has largely disappeared? Uh, I don't know that it's largely disappeared. I think that that resistance is, uh, is greatly lessened, yes. And, and you think that the principle of reciprocal trade, meaning the principle of uh, accepting that we must trade with the rest of the world, we must let them sell here as well as sell goods to them, you think that that's uh, firmly accepted in the United States now? I think it's firmly accepted in, in all major industries by the leaders in those industries. How about the American consumers? Do you think that they are convinced? <coughs> oh, let's call them American taxpayers. Are they convinced that uh, we must have uh, two-way trade between nations? Otherwise, we are going to have to uh, support Europe through such devices as ECA or the Marshall Plan? Well, I think you have given the answer uh, in the latter part of your statement. I think that it's the, the, that uh, it's this this heavy. Uh, uh, aid program we have we have had through Marshall aid and so on, which was very essential, uh, has convinced them that there must be some other answer. Is that it essential is now? Marshall aid? Yes. Uh, nothing like the extent to which it was in the beginning. I look upon Marshall aid as very essential pump priming. Well, is it uh, essential to the extent of seven and a half billion dollars as we have appropriated in 1951? I don't think so. I think that it was correct in 1951, but when we hear that uh, the administration is thinking of a similar amount for 1952, I think you're getting away from the principle of pump priming, and I think you are, uh, you, you are running grave danger there of causing uh, uh, the people abroad to become too accustomed to this help and uh, to, to get away from self-help. So you, you on that point, sir, <coughs> You're in favor of cutting Marshall aid approximately in half for 1952. I think the mutual aid program should uh, be cut approximately in half in 1952. Now, our American people have always liked to think that we are a self-satisfied uh, country, that we don't have to import raw materials. Now, are we importing large amounts of raw materials today, sir? I'm awfully glad you raised that question because it's one of the strongest proofs of the need of international trade, Mr. Huey. Uh, we are absolutely dependent upon uh, imports of uh, tin ore, some 97% of it comes from abroad. Uh, we, uh, we import a very substantial amount of our bauxite uh, uh, needs for the aluminum industry, some 47% from abroad, and uh, so on. And we are even importing oil, I believe, today. We are. I can't give you the percentages, but we are importing oil. Is it true that our steel industry couldn't exist without its imports of various uh, minor metals that go into steel? Manganese. Such as manganese. Manganese yeah. about 100% from foreign countries. Without it, we couldn't manufacture Not only that, steel. Mr. Rogers, we're coming to the end someday in, in the future, in the not too distant future, of our iron ore reserves in this country. That's why you see the steel industry going to Labrador today, exploring the possibilities there, and you'll see the U.S. Steel Corporation going to Venezuela. Then this isn't pure altruism oh, on our part. Not. We're, we're looking out certainly for the not. United States. We're with, looking with out for Uncle Sam right. and, and, the, and the people of this country. I'm sure that our audience would like your prediction, sir. You don't think that uh, we're going to have anything like a high American tariff at this period deliberately designed to curtail the sales of foreign goods in the United States. No, do I don't think so. I don't think we'll ever return to the Smoot-Hawley tariff uh, 
You think that we as a people, we've reached the, we've also reached the period in our development as a nation when uh, many of our resources are being exhausted and we are, we must have raw materials uh, beyond our own geographical boundaries. So you think that it's intelligent selfishness on our part to develop world trade, don't you? Enlightened self-interest, exactly. And Returning quickly uh, to the ECA, uh, do you feel that uh, ECA is being administered uh, adequately, fairly, uh, with competence in Europe? Well, Mr. Rogers, uh, when you say ECA, I mean you mean mu uh, mutual aid, yes, the ECA as such terminated quite recently. Uh, I think they, they, they've done a remarkably good job. I think, though, that, uh, that uh, in all of our efforts abroad, of, in the nature of economic aid, uh, we have so many men that have become more or less uh, professionals in this matter of giving away American money. And not American uh, patriotism. Well, uh, and, and they, they, they're losing their knowledge of economics, I'm afraid, and they're not concentrating as much thought on helping those countries to help themselves as they are in, in just learning how to give away money. Yes. Mr. Sloan, I'm sure that our audience has appreciated your views a great deal tonight, and thank you for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Donald I. Rogers and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was Mr. George A. Sloan, Chairman of the United States Council of the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, tonight, I'd like to tell you how to take care of your Longines Whitnor gift watch. First, the winding. Wind your Longines Whitnor watch once each day, in the morning, before putting the watch on your wrist. Never, never wind it on your wrist. There just isn't room for the fingers, and this uneven pressure can lead to expensive repair bills because of damage due to excessive wear. Now, about setting your Longines Whitnor watch. When you set it, Pull the stem out gently, and then turn the hands forward or backward, whichever way takes the least turning. I don't have to tell you not to drop your watch, and please keep it dry. And I have a special word of caution for the ladies. Face powder and watches just don't mix. Please don't keep your Longines Whitnor watch in your handbag unless the watch is wrapped in tissue paper. And I don't mean cleansing tissue. And the same caution goes for the bureau drawer where you keep your makeup. Give it simple care. Take it to your Longines Whitnor jeweler for periodic cleaning, and your Longines Whitnor watch will give you years of faithful and dependable service. It'll become an honored friend that you can trust. To all new owners of Longines Whitnor gift watches, congratulations. And to those who were perhaps disappointed in not receiving one, good luck for the future. Longines and Whitnor watches are made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight again, inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.